What's up everybody, Rob here. So, in 1754, the tensions between the various European powers exploded into a multinational war, and eventually the fighting spread to North America. Well, the spark that set off this particular powder keg was lit by a particular Virginia militia colonel, but that's another story for another day. Well, in any case, the British found themselves at odds with the French, because, you know, of course they did. I mean, it's Britain, it's France, of course they're going to want to kill each other. In any case, the traditional combat tactics of the European powers, which were highly effective in the Old World with its large expanses of cleared far land and relatively open terrain, proved to be rather ineffective in the dense forests and untamed wilderness of the New World. The French and their Indian allies were difficult to combat using the traditional tactics of mass men marching in formation, delivering volley after volley at point-blank range into other ranks of mass men who were trying to do the exact same thing. If the British were going to be successful in the New World, they had to adopt their tactics. They would need to learn from the natives of North America in order to fight more effectively. Now, this particular set of tactics was nothing new. Uh, they were first utilized about a century or so earlier by Benjamin Church during King Philip's War, as well as in subsequent conflicts, but these lessons would often be forgotten after the war ended. So in 1755, a member of the New Hampshire militia started to recruit a new unit that would use these lightning-fast tactics in order to beat the French and the Indians at their own game. Robert Rogers was a veteran of King George's War, which kicked off in 1744, and while fighting there, he served in a ranger company. The lessons he learned there would become the backbone for what would become Rogers Rangers. The word ranger is a derivation of the verb to range, which means to travel between two fixed points. They originally were um, gamekeepers and um, huntsmen, stuff like that, back in medieval and early modern Europe. Um, basically, gamesmen, um, sort of an early form of game warden or something of that nature, and the name just carried over. Now, unlike their red coat counterparts, the rangers would use tactics more akin to those of the native North Americans. They would use hit and run and guerrilla tactics, utilizing speed and surprise, and then melt away before the enemy had a chance to react. They would be much more lightly equipped compared to the red coat counterparts, and as such, they could conduct raids deep into enemy territory in areas that the French and their Indian allies thought were secure. Because they valued speed and mobility above all else, the equipment of the rangers was markedly different from the regular British counterparts. Now they wore green coats, uh, famously wore green coats instead of the bright red, though it's important to note that the rangers seem to take the wearing of this particular uniform as more of a, mm, I guess you can say a guideline than an actual hard and fast rule, and um, they would often just wear whatever they felt like. One British officer said that they looked more like savages than actual soldiers, but hey, whatever. Well, in any case, and the coat itself was cut back and shortened, so it wouldn't be as much of an encumbrance in the dense forests of North America. Now, they did use muskets and bayonets, much like their, um, much like their regular army counterparts, um, but they would also utilize weapons like tomahawks and hunting knives, as opposed to the long sabers and hangers of standard British infantry regiments. They also made use of hunting rifles, which were astonishingly accurate, but they did have the downside of being uh, much harder to reload much slower rate of fire, and more prone to jamming. Over the course of the French and Indian War, Rogers Rangers would prove themselves to be invaluable to the British war effort in the New World, acting as scouts for the British Army, while at the same time keeping pressure on the French and their Indian allies in their rear areas, cutting off supply lines, and just generally making life as difficult as possible for them. The British commander of North America, the Duke of Cumberland, was greatly impressed by Rogers Rangers, as well as the other Ranger companies. Uh, just important to note here that Rogers Rangers were not the only Ranger company. There were some others as well, including Israel Putnam's Connecticut Rangers, uh, Joseph Gorham and George Scott's Nova Scotia Rangers, and Hezekiah Dunn's New Jersey Rangers. Well, anyway, the Duke of Cumberland was impressed by the Rangers in general and recognized their accomplishments and abilities and encouraged the regular line infantry to adopt some of the Rangers' tactics. Still, the British were badly outmatched in the early stages of the war. The French had more Indian allies than the British and were more able to adapt to the new type of warfare and to do so much more quickly. In 1757, one of the major outposts of the British in North America, Fort William Henry, would fall to the French in an event that would be depicted in the book and the movie The Last of the Mohicans. This event sent absolute shockwaves of panic through the British. Plans were accelerated to increase the number of ranger companies, and by the end of the war, Rogers Rangers consisted of over 1,200 members, including three companies of Indians. 
Now, like I said before, there were ranger units before the French and Indian War broke out, and Rogers Rangers were not the only ranger company during the conflict. But Robert Rogers was the first to codify the practices of ranger companies into a coherent form. He laid out 28 rules, which became known as Robert Rogers' 28 Rules of Ranging. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them because that would take too long. You can easily look this up. This is, you know, very easy information to find. But some of the highlights are uh, rule number two, for example. Whenever you are ordered out to the enemy's forts or frontiers for discoveries, if your numbers be small, march in, sing march in a single file, keeping at such a distance from each other as to prevent one shot from killing two men, sending one man or more forward and the like on each side, at a distance of 20 yards from your main body. If the ground over... If the ground you march over will admit it, to give signal to the officer of the approach of an enemy and of their number. So basically, keep out flankers and um, an advanced patrol or an advanced guard to prevent against enemy ambushes. You know, pretty simple, uh, pretty obvious stuff, uh, but this was the first time it had been codified. Or Rule 21, if the enemy pursue your rear, take a circle till you come to your own tracks and there form an ambush to receive them and give them the first fire. So basically just wheel around and ambush your ambushers. The other rules include what to do when surrounded by a superior enemy force, um, how to put out sentries for the night to avoid being ambushed or um, discovered while resting, and other similar types of orders. All right, enough of the backstory. Here are some of the highlights of Rogers Rangers and their activities during the French and Indian War. Their first major clash was with the French, which took place in 1757 in an event called the Battle of the Snowshoes. Robert Rogers and 74 of his rangers were scouting in an area north of Fort William Henry, which was still under British control at this point, when they spotted a sled carrying several French soldiers and supplies. The rangers began to pursue the fleeing sled, only to be discovered by two more French sleds, which immediately turned back to Fort Carleon. Um, and again, this is my normal disclaimer, my pronunciation of foreign words is atrocious, you're just going to have to get used to it. In any case, um, Rogers gave pursue and captured seven of the French, but most of the French managed to escape. Realizing that the French would raise the alarm at the approach of the Rangers, Rogers ordered his company to retreat. Now he made a tactical blunder when he ordered the Rangers to withdraw to their previous camp. Um, Rogers' own standing orders, in this case, order number 10, required that in just such a scenario, they would withdraw using a different route, but he thought that given the circumstances, speed was much more essential than secrecy. In any case, the French pursued with a force of about 180 regular infantry, Canadian militia, and their Indian allies. The Rangers were caught completely off guard by the approach of the French. The Rangers were able to avoid being completely overwhelmed by the vast numbers of the French by the quick thinking of John Stark, uh, Rogers' friend and his second in command, who with a detachment of his own men formed a defensive line and laid down covering fire for the others to retreat. Deep snow was also a hindrance for the French, and the British were able to escape since they had snowshoes, which actually is why the battle is called the Battle of the Snowshoes. Well, in any case, they had the mobility to withdraw. The French prisoners that were taken by Rogers were executed so they wouldn't slow down the retreat. Altogether, the Rangers lost 14 men killed in action, with 9 wounded and 6 missing or captured. The French, the Canadians, and the Indian Allies lost 11 killed in action and about 27 wounded. The Rangers would continue to work as scouts and guerrillas for the British throughout 1757. A company of Rogers Rangers were involved at the capture and later the massacre of the garrison of Fort William Henry, although Robert Rogers and the bulk of the Rangers were not present at that point. After the fall of Fort William Henry, the activities of the Ranger would continue throughout the year into the winter of 1757-1758. And in March of 1758, the Rangers would suffer their greatest defeat at the hands of the French. On March 13th, the Second Battle of the Snowshoes would be fought near Lake George in upstate New York, an event that would be the lowest point in Robert Rogers' career as a commander. It began when Rogers led 180 Rangers on a mission to scout French positions near Fort Carleon. Fortunately, the number was reduced from the planned 400. Also, the British commander let slip that the Rangers would be departing, something that the entire garrison knew. A British soldier on a patrol that went out before Rogers set out was captured by the French while while on patrol and may have told his captors about the approach of the Rangers. Well, as they approached Fort Carleon, the French, alerted to their presence, set out two parties of their own Ranger equivalents to intercept the Rangers. Rogers stumbled upon one of these parties and set up an ambush. 
at Roger Signal, the Rangers opened fire, killing several of the French. In their enthusiasm to pursue their fleeing enemies, the Rangers made the amateurish mistake of not reloading. The second French party, consisting of about 200 men, mostly of Canadian militia and French Marines, heard the shooting and prepared themselves for the Rangers' approach. Rogers and the other Rangers ran straight into the waiting French, who delivered a volley point-blank range. The ambushers were now the ambushed. Rogers and the surviving Rangers were now in a desperate retreat and were engaged in a running gun battle with the pursuing French. Rogers and the remaining Rangers took up positions on Bald Mountain, a patch of high ground on the shores of Lake George. The French pressed on closely, not giving the Rangers any rest from the onslaught. The Rangers were forced to throw back repeated French and Indian assaults, but their numbers were dwindling as the firefight continued on. Rogers' plan seemed to have been to hold out until nightfall and then escape under the cover of darkness. Uh, the French commander seemed to have figured this out and launched a massive assault on the Rangers' position, hoping to overwhelm and envelop the depleted numbers of Rogers' Rangers. The left wing and the center of the Rangers' position managed to hold back the French assaults, but the right wing was completely overrun. Seeing this, Rain Rogers ordered the remaining rangers to disperse, each man fending for himself and gathering at a rally point on the western bank of Lake George. With this order, the rangers broke their positions, Rogers himself reportedly sliding down a 400-foot slope onto the frozen surface of Lake George, uh, which is now known as Rogers Slide. Um, now, there's really no evidence to suggest they actually did this. It's hard to prove, but, you know, the name stuck. In an attempt to escape, Rogers ditched his personal belongings, including his coat which held his officer's commission. The French would discover this later and think that they had killed their most hated enemy. Though Rogers did escape, over 150 of the 180 men that set out were killed or captured. The Rangers were horribly crippled by this particular battle. The theme of British setbacks would continue out through 1758, when the British launched an offensive against Fort Carleon, but they would be repulsed with heavy casualties. The first few years of the French and Indian War were marked by British defeat after British defeat. They were really having difficulty adapting to warfare on the new continent uh, as quickly and, and as effectively as the French were. This would change in 1759. That year, the British went on the offensive again, and Fort Carleon fell. Lord Geoffrey Amherst, the victor at Carleon, wanted to establish communications with General Wolfe, who was on campaign in Quebec. A party of rangers and Stockbridge Indians under the command of Captain Quinton Kennedy set out to establish contact with Wolfe. Their party was intercepted by Abnaki Indians who turned the men over to the French. When news finally reached Amherst, there were rumors of Abnaki mistreatment of the captives, torture, ritual torture, and, you know, other such pleasantries. Amherst wanted revenge, and he sent Rogers and the rangers to go exact it. Rogers gathered 220 men, including Stockbridge and Mohican Indians, who also wanted a little bit of payback against their hated Abnaki foe. Though this was ostensibly a mission of revenge, Amherst did not want non-combatants to be harmed. He said, and I quote, Remember the barbarities that have been committed by the enemy's scoundrels on every occasion, where they had an opportunity of showing their infamous cruelties on the king's subjects, which they have done without mercy. Take your revenge, but don't forget, it is my orders that no women or children are to be killed or hurt. The Rangers were about to set out on the largest and most successful raid of their careers. Now, Robert Rogers had learned from previous mistakes of what happens when operational security is breached. So rather than letting the enemy find out what he was doing, he actually preemptively, him along with Amherst actually, preemptively leaked information to confuse the French. All that they knew were that the Rangers were leaving, but several messages were sent out reporting that they would be going in many different directions. The French had no idea what the actual location or target of the Rangers' activities were. The Rangers' target would be the village of St. Francis, which is located along the St. Francis River near the confluence with that river and the St. Lawrence River. It's in modern-day Quebec, Canada. So on September 13th, 1759, the Rangers set out on whale boats, heading north, but due to increased enemy patrols, had to abandon the craft and continued on foot leaving the boats hidden with two Indian guards. The French discovered and captured the boats while the two guards managed to escape and inform Rogers of what had happened. Upon receiving the news, Rogers held a council of war. They were deep within enemy territory, with the French alerted to their presence, and their escape route now cut off. It was decided by the council that they should press on with their mission anyway and retreat back to English lines on a much more circuitous route. The route to St. Francis had also changed as well, 
with the Rangers now being forced to slog their way through through the marshy swampland of upstate New York and Canada. The men were soaking wet for days as they struggled onward, only reaching dry ground along the banks of the St. Francis River near to their target. The Rangers forded the river and positioned themselves outside of the village. By this point, the Rangers' food supply had completely run out. It was honestly do or die time for them. Most of the warriors of St. Francis were away, assisting the French. The ones that remained behind spent that night before the raid involved in dancing, a ritual preparation for a potential scouting party. Rogers placed his best shots around the camp, ready to kill anyone trying to escape. He then positioned his men in three columns around the settlement. At daybreak on October 4th, the rangers stormed into the village, catching the Indians completely off guard. The warriors were completely exhausted from the previous night's festivities, and no organized resistance could be mounted. Doors were kicked in, and the rangers shot, knifed, and tomahawked anybody they found. Amherst's orders to spare non-combatants were ignored. Men, women, and children were all butchered alike. Anybody who tried to escape from the village were cut down by the sharpshooters posted outside of the camp. In the aftermath, Rogers ordered the village to be burned down, and the corn from the Indian storehouses to be taken to resupply the starving rangers. Rogers and the rangers estimated that they had killed over 200 Indians. The French, who would eventually respond to this, would report that about 30 had been killed. The truth is really anybody's guess. As the rangers withdrew, the French, in a nearby settlement, had found out about the attack and launched a response. Knowing that he was being pursued and that the French knew about his planned escape route, Rogers cut a path through uncharted wilderness, hoping to reach Fort Number 4. Moving as quickly as possible over completely unknown and uncharted terrain with prisoners in tow, the rangers covered over 70 miles in eight days, but then their food began to run out. In desperation, Rogers ordered his men to break up into smaller groups of about 10 to 20 men, which would make foraging for food easier, but at the same time make them much more vulnerable to the French and their counterattack. It's difficult to say exactly what happened to each band, and uh, honestly, it would be, it would take kind of long to go through it all here, but there are multiple accounts of rampant starvation, cannibalism, and other privations along the way. Some of these bands would be captured by the French and others would be killed by vengeful Indians. The group that Rogers led himself would eventually make it to a planned rally point and arrange supplies, but none would be found there. The men of Ranger's party were too tired to continue on, so he and three others built a raft and continued onwards, promising to return within 10 days to their position with food. He arrived at Fort Number 4 on October 31st, barely able to walk. Immediately, supplies were dispatched upriver towards the rangers that he had left behind, and eventually relief would reach the men within 10 days. The rangers lost many men during the retreat from St. Francis, but overall the mission was a success. The Abnaki were completely knocked out of the war, and there was a clear line of communication now established between Lake George and Quebec. After the raid of St. Francis, the war was winding down. The rangers continued to work as a scouting force for the British, and upon the surrender of the French, the rangers were amongst those who would garrison the newly captured Fort Detroit. After the war, they would play a key role during Pontiac's Rebellion, possibly a subject of a video for another day. But for the most part, the men, upon the conclusion of hostilities, returned to their homes. A decade later, when the American Revolution broke out in 1775, Robert Rogers tried to offer services to the Continental Army and the Patriot cause. George Washington turned him down, fearing that he might be a British sympathizer because he had just returned from a long stay in Britain. Rebuffed by this, Rogers then offered his service to the British, who, well, they accepted. And in 1776, he formed the Queen's Rangers and later on the King's Rangers. After the war, Rogers would leave the colonies and make his way to London, England, where he would die in 1795. Now, fast forward a few centuries to the outbreak of World War II and the U.S. Army was trying to set up its own special operations branch, something along the lines of the British commandos. Though the tactics and methodology that the Americans would eventually adopt would be based on that of their British counterparts, the commander of the operation didn't like the name of commando. He thought it was too European sounding. So going back into the history books, he decided upon the name of Ranger, and thus the U.S. Army Rangers were born. The members of today's U.S. Army Rangers claim a lineage stretching back to that of Robert Rogers and Rogers Rangers, with every member of today's 75th Ranger Regiment receiving a copy of Rogers Rules for Ranging.
and through them, the legacy of Robert Rogers and his Rangers lives on to the present day. So that's pretty much it. Hit the like and subscribe button if you enjoyed this. Send it out and um, share this with all your friends. Share it with your enemies too. Really, I don't care. I'm not going to judge you. In any case, um, yeah, that's it. More videos coming out whenever I get around to it. Have a good day. Or don't. See you later.